Ladies and gentlemen, welcome at the fifth Masterclass Middle East, the last one of uh, this year. And uh, as you will see, we will end with a height. Very interesting subject, very interesting speaker. But I would like to welcome you first in the name of the organizers, which is uh, the Institute for European Studies of uh, VUB, Brussels University. Omnis, who has been, I think, amazing in organizing the several cartoonists, one of which is Kanyush, who will also be working uh, today. He has been here before. We are so very happy. Um, the problem is that the cartoonist who was normally scheduled today realized at the airport of Rabat in Morocco that his passport was expired. So he came with the fast train from Paris in order to uh, uh, replace him. Thank you very much, uh, Kanyush, for being here. And we will also talk uh, after uh, the lecture with a few questions, uh, which is the organization of Omnis. Then, of course, Bozar, who has been uh, giving this uh, most splendid location in Brussels. And I'm from the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. Um, welcome again, and I would like to pass the word to the executive director of the Institute of European Studies, Anthony Antoine. Please have the floor. Thank you very much, Kurt. Uh, dear guests and uh, Ladies and gentlemen, yeah, also uh, in my name, uh, uh, a warm welcome to this fifth and last uh, masterclass, uh, Middle East, um, organized by, well, you have them, and there's just been all <coughs> very well uh, explained. Um, as uh, director of the uh, Institute for European Studies, I'm replacing uh, Luc Verlangenover, who um, sends his regards to everybody, and definitely the known ones uh, here in front. Um, it's my pleasure, of course, to, to welcome the guest speaker of tonight, and uh, that is Professor Oz Hassan from uh, Warwick University. Uh, professor Hassan is an associate professor and uh, director of the graduate studies uh, in uh, the politics and international studies department uh, of the University of Warwick. And he joined that department in 2009, shortly before completing his uh, PhD um, that was on US democracy promotion in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, a thesis for which uh, he did substantial research in the area. Now the results we uh, were put in, in book form uh, entitled Constructing America's Freedom Agenda for the Middle East, Democracy or Domination. Between 13, 2013 and 2016, uh, Dr. Hassan was the primary investigator on uh, a future research leaders project on the Economic and Social Research Council called Transatlantic Interests and Democratic Possibility in a Transforming Middle East. The project analysis, or project analyzes US and EU politics uh, in Egypt, Morocco, and Saudi Arabia in order to um, access how conflict of interests continue in the post-Arab spring environment and how these can be overcome to promote democracy. He's therefore the most prominent speaker uh, for the subject of uh, tonight. Also joining us uh, tonight um, is uh, Kianush, um, who was born in uh, Iran um, and now lives in Paris. And uh, it's not surprising that he left uh, that beautiful country of Iran in 2009 since he's a political cartoonist. Um, since 2015, he runs um, a um, organization called uh, United Sketches, or United Sketches International, an organization that fights for the freedom of press and primarily focusing on uh, cartoonists. Now, uh, Kianosh, we're, we're looking forward to the results of your sharp pen uh, at the end of uh, this evening. Uh, but before that, uh, Oz will enlighten us on the role of Saudi Arabia uh, in the Middle East. Is Saudi Arabia uh, the democracy blocker uh, in the region, or isn't it all that simple? Oz, the floor is yours. Um, well, firstly, th thank you uh, to the IES, Ohms, Bozar for having me, um, Anthony for introducing me, Luke for inviting me, um, and Kurt very graciously um, for helping organize 
Um, and obviously now to the cartoonist that I'm absolutely terrified of um, <laughs> as to how this is going, going to go on. Uh, an Iranian cartoonist uh, on a speech about Saudi Arabia it, it should produce some pretty interesting results. Um, so when I was asked to deal with you know, what is Saudi Arabia's role in the Middle East, one of the, the, the sort of purpose I took from this was to try and explain what Saudi Arabia's role is both globally, regionally, and from a sort of local perspective. And the aim of that was really to show how Saudi Arabia fits into different systems which, which are actually in tension with one another, which I will explain as we go along. So on the one hand, you have this international system that Saudi Arabia is part of, but you know, the, the global system. And on the other, you have this Middle Eastern subsystem that it is the hegemon of, if you like. So basically how it fits between these two things, it helps to explain Saudi Arabia's behavior and ultimately its role within the region. Um, and so what, I want, what I'm gonna try and do in this talk is give an understanding of both world history and combine that with social constructivism from international relations and from security studies um, and mix that in somehow with area studies. It's a tall task, I know, uh, but I will, will give it a go. Um, and, but what the reason being this or having this approach is really to try and help us explain why the Gulf region has moved from you know, hunter-gatherers, if you like, as, as a region, all the way up to Saudi Arabia now being a global leader in the deployment of artificial intelligence. It's quite a, an interesting story to sort of tell. And so my argument up front is, fairly, uh, is a fairly simple one. It is that Saudi Arabia's role in the Middle East is to survive. It's a normal state, it will survive. Its aim, if you like, is survival. Um, or more specifically, it's to ensure that it, the survival of the House of Saud. Um, and as it balances between the international and the regional subsystem. In practice, what this means is that securing the, region, region's regi the, the regime's wealth, uh, preventing direct challenges to the House of Saud, preventing the emergence of a regional rival or an alternative Islamic state model emerging, um, or any other sort of powerful actor like Egypt or Turkey becoming um, a hegemon in the region, and obviously containing Iran. So let's start with definitions, because I think this, is, this becomes absolutely crucial to, 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 to how I'm going to explain this role. Um, in many ways, I agree with the idea of the Middle East being a region, right? It is a region, it is something we talk about. And yet, on the, on the other hand, the Middle East is actually a concept. And it was a, it's a very interesting concept, one that is derived from history. So if you take uh, the way other people have described what the Middle East is, um, Leo, in 1958, Le Leonard um, Binder defines it as uh, the sort of former territories of the Ottoman Empire, along with neighboring countries challenging Western-style nationalism. Um, so that's Libya through to Iran with a core of Arab states, um, Israel, um, and then at the fringe of it, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Paul Nobel, on the other hand, his focus is just on Arab states, and he excludes Iran, he excludes Turkey and Israel, and uses the word Arab world in, in the way in which he describes it. Um, Gregory Gauls uses Middle East, consists uh, of states that are held together by the bonds of asymmetric inter interdependence. Um, and Lake, the Middle East, is a, re a regional security complex, a set of states in which policies carried out by one state generate externalities that ignite, escalate, or mitigate conflicts within other states. It is a regional subsystem, if you like. And what that means is that includes the Caucasus, Central Eurasia, South Asia, and North and East Africa. But what all this, for me, tells us is not that, you know, uh, that, that, that they've actually defined what the Middle East is. What it tells us is that the Middle East is, in fact, a concept. It doesn't have an end, if you like. It's not something that is fixed. There's no fixity to the concept itself. Um, and so what's remarkable about these definitions is their lack or sense of history as they're going through them. It lacks that understanding about the colonial past the region has, has got, okay? So in that sense, the Middle East is not just a place, it's actually an idea. 
It's not just a sort of material landscape, it's not a geography, but it's an ideational factor as much as it is a geographical space. And the reason this space is so porous is because of the way history and ideas have made that so. So if you look at this through the lens, or the region through the lens of world history, it really helps you find out where this idea has come from. Um, and therefore can help us explain what Saudi Arabia's role in it is. Um, so let's go back to sort of, you know, the foundations of civilization, if you like. Around 4,000 to 3,000 BCE, what you have is the Sumerian city-states emerging. And so in Mesopotamia, that area between Iraq, uh, well, mostly Iraq, and then some of uh, Iran, Syria, and Turkey today, you've got this fertile crescent that actually is part of um, the, uh, what was referred to al as Al Jazeera, the island, that was actually the founding of civilization itself. And the state system, if you like, gets founded at that point in history. It's at this point that you've got the Akkad and the Babylonians setting up trading routes between each other and setting up a region um, and sort of the Akkad go on and form sort of the first empire and things like that. But what you've got at this point is no Middle East. Yeah? No one refers to that at the time as the Middle East. No one sort of, it's not a concept that exists. If you then go around 3,500 BCE, you have the Egyptian city-states um, moving on to the dynastic period. You then have the end of the Sumerian period brought, um, brought down by the, um, by, the for, uh, by the Babylonian Empire. Um, around uh, 1050 BCE, you have the Kingdom of Israel. Um, he moves sort of forward still by 900 BCE. You've got the first recordings of the Arab Arabs within the region. So by 800 uh, to 300 BCE, you've got this axial period where the birth of philosophy begin begins to take place. And the area basically plays a really important role in the philosophy of religion and the way in which uh, the philosophy of Jerusalem comes around and the way in which um, the Hebrew prophets work. And then you've kind of got after that this sort of Greek and Persian period with their empires, which is when we get the first recording, uh, recordings of Arabs living in the region. So Homer makes reference to the Arab peoples. Um, and then Herodotus in uh, 484 BCE begins to talk about and extend this to the Arabian Peninsula. He says the Arabs and the Arabian Peninsula become one. Um, and that's sort of, you know, referring to a set of Bedouin individuals. And so what's really interesting around, about this is it's not until later on when we move into the 7th century that we've got the birth of Islam. Um, with the conquest of Mecca by Muhammad in six, uh, 630 uh, Common Era. It's after Muhammad's death that you've got this series of, four, uh, of caliphates, and then Uthman unites the Arabian Peninsula with the Levant through to North Africa, Iran, Central and Southern Asia. And what you end up with is this sort of region dominated by Islam, united by religion throughout the 9th and 12th centuries, creating this Arab golden period, this sort of this period that was ended by the Mongol conquests, but that was absolutely fundamental to the way in which modern science was translated over to the Greek, uh, to the Greek periods and, through, and, and, in, uh, sorry, and into, into Europe. So by the time you've got to this point, it's not until you've got uh, go through to the Ottoman Empire as it established itself in 1299 um, through, to the, uh, through to its collapse at the, in the early 20th century. Now, what's really interesting about the history that I've described very briefly is that nowhere in this history is the Middle East. It's not a concept that exists. It's not something that individuals or history at the time of its construction was actually referred to. No one referred to this as the Middle East. So what happens, and so why does this matter? It matters because what it does is it tells us something really, really interesting about Saudi Arabia's role within what we understand as the modern Middle East. It tells us that, yes, you've got this area, this geography, that, uh, uh, and these different societies all mixing in this geographical space that is absolutely central to the history of humanity. But actually, you know, it's, it's, it's far more than that. It's not until you get to the 20th century that the, United, uh, that the Middle East becomes this idea. It becomes a unit of analysis. It becomes something that exists in people's minds. It becomes an identity that people use. So 
what this means up until that point, up until, throughout, up until the sort of 19th century, is that you had these sort of oriental civilizations over there. Yeah? You had this sort of, you know, um, people when they spoke, they spoke of societies as the other. You know, it's, that's, it's the stuff that Edward Said talks about. But the Middle East as an idea does not exist through the Paleolithic, the Neolithic era. It's not part of the way in which we understand um, civilizations as they move uh, f f through to the 7th century. It's, it's really around the 19th century and into the early 20th century that the region becomes the focus of Western powers, and it's with that focus that you get the origins of the Middle East as a unit of analysis in its own right. So if you trace back the term where it actually, where it sort of comes from is, is this sort of vague strategic concept pointing to a geocultural region and a system built around Western interests in the region. It's a concept built in the, as, as part of a framework of imperialist strategic planning in the early 20th century and ultimately around the security of oil as, as warships uh, move over from steam to oil. It becomes about warfare and geopolitics. So as a term, the geopolitics of the term matters. So herein, what you begin to get is the Middle East used as a sort of geocultural term, but always within reference to this strategic idea. Um, and herein, what we begin to see is Saudi Arabia and, the in, and its interactions with this international system gets adopted within this term and begins to use it for its own means. It uses its, its oil wealth. So as a concept in the 19th century, if you like, people would have referred to the Eastern question or non-European spaces. You then had the Near East as referring to the Ottoman Empire, the Far East as China and Japan. It's not until 1900 in the British Foreign Office that you get the Middle East referred to as a, as a problem. The problem of the Middle East is, is, is how, the, how the region was constructed as the Ottoman Empire began to, began to, um, began to um, fray. Um, it, the Times newspaper was popularized, popularized the term uh, when it entitled uh, a series The Middle Eastern Question. And then in 1902, the person who's credited with actually inventing the term Middle East, Alfred Thayer Mahan, um, come, it basically comes up with his term when he's talking about the Persian Gulf and international relations. And what he's done is he's talking about the, the importance of the Persian Gulf in relation to this, tra this shift from um, different energy sources and the rise of oil. So in that sense, it's, it, the, the concept as a strategic concept begins to arrive at that point. In 1951, you have the United Kingdom adopt the Middle East as official terminology, and it's not until 1958 that the, US can, the United States confirms that the Middle East or Near East can be used as interchangeable terms. By the 1960s and the 1970s, um, that the term Middle East gets adopted within the region. The people within the region, you begin to use it to construct pan-Arabism, to construct this wider identity of who they are, rather than just sort of being individual sets of peoples. So what Saudi Arabia's role in the region of the Middle East is very much embedded in the term itself. It is that Saudi Arabia's role is the linchpin in a system of strategic and imperial control outside and inside of this geographical space. It plays a role it, 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 for, for that outside system and links the inside system, if you like. So Saudi survival is tied to both systems. It's not separate from them. The for the global system, Saudi Arabia has taken on this role since the 1930s. It's provided the West with a supply of oil and stable prices, for the most part, obviously not 1970s. Um, it's dealt with military contracts, trying to balance out Iran, um, security in the region, buttress regional alliances, um, and be a, a place for trade and, 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 and investment. So Saudi Arabia's role from a Western perspective is to be a client state, a hegemon to protect the system that was constructed as part of empire. This is not by accident, therefore. It is by design. Saudi Arabia's role is not separate to what, what has happened in the early 20th century. 
So this really sort of begins to sort of pan out, and by the 19 uh, 1970s, what you've got is this, cru what's crucial here is what is where Simons uh, over in Treasury, in the US Treasury, and Kissinger begin to argue over, you know, what's the best way for the United States to control the Middle East? Is it to prop up Iran and the Shah and give the Shah as many weapons as he can afford with his new petrodollars, or is it to back Saudi Arabia? That's part of the empire conversation that literally goes on between the Treasury um, and, 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 and the State Department in the 1970s. So this has moved Saudi Arabia from being just a sort of primary security partner um, and fighting communism before the 1970s um, and opposing Nasser's secularism and, and the sort of socialist turn to really being a powerful actor in its own right in the 1970s. Um, and this is, was really demonstrated by the 1973 oil crisis, which sent an oil shock around the world. Um, I mean, in, this was—I mean, the, the, the reason for the crisis, if you like, was that Nixon g gave 2.2 billion dollars um, in military aid to Israel, triggering Saudi Arabia to take action that damaged the industrial world. Saudi Arabia's policy, interestingly, failed because Saudi Arabia's policy was to get the United States to change, to, 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 to not support Israel in that way. But what it showed is just how powerful Saudi Arabia by the 1970s had come because of how de dependent the West was on, on, on energy in the form of oil. Um, it also, the, the consequences of that crisis have transformed the world we live in today in many ways because what it done, interestingly, is it's at that point in history that um, international political economy began to change. In response to the crisis, to prop up Europe, the, banking, the American banking system internationalized. It said that the Europeans were over leveraged, therefore they needed to, uh, to be backed up and internationalized the system, a system that we live with the consequences of today. So it's really sort of that period that, that's particularly interesting as a demonstration of Saudi power, but also the very special role that it plays as, uh, within the region uh, balancing out this in, these international dynamics and the regional dynamics. Um, this sort of we begins to weaken between 1975 and 81 as the US sort of, sorry, weakens, strengthens uh, between 1975 and uh, 1981 as the US builds its special relationship with Saudi Arabia. Um, this, uh, the particular turning point in that was 1976 when Saudi Arabia helped um, evacuate uh, US citizens from Lebanon safely. But really around this era, what you've got is this, this twin pillar system, or the Nixon doctrine, up until the 1979 Iranian Revolution, um, which has basically given Saudi Arabia the sort of, the ability, if you like, to sort of control, or, or as a lever, between the way these two systems work. Um, by the 1980s, what you have is a more realistic and balanced expectation as you've got oil prices declining around the world. You've got Saudi Arabia di diversifying its arms and purchases. Um, and by the 1990s, what you've got is this growing insecurity in the Gulf with Iraq's invasion of Kuwait and the subsequent U.S. intervention in 1991. So... In the 1990s through to 2001, you've obviously got this period where Saudi Arabia is a source of instability because you've got you know, Al-Qaeda operating there, you've got the rise of international terrorism um, from, uh, from Saudi nationals. And by, by the time you get to this sort of post-2001 period, you've got a real problem in international and regional change as both systems become in flux. And I'll talk more about that momentarily. Because um, what you've got in the system now is, you know, sort of U.S. interventions in, from 2003 Onwards, you've got the rise of China, you've got the re-emergence of Russian activism, and obviously you have the Arab awakenings, the Arab revolutions. So for the US, and this is the, uh, the important part, the, since the third Sta Saudi state was established, it has had a clear function in the Middle East and been allowed to pursue that function as a client state. It's been to protect and allow the exercise of what James Tully refers to as the imperial right. 
And that is the right of Western states and their companies to trade freely in non-European societies and the duty to, uh, to civilize, be civilized by non-European, uh, pe to civilize European peoples, non-European peoples, sorry. Um, together with a duty of hospitality of non-European peoples to open themselves up to trade and civilization. If indigenous peoples resist and def uh, defend their own constitutional forms and constituent powers and civilizations and thus violate the international duty of hospitality, the imperial uh, powers have the right and duty to impose coercively the conditions of trade, hospitality and civilization. So what I'm trying to do here is explain what this imperial right is. It's this sense of ownership and courtesy that must be extended, that that, that, that linkage is part of the way the system's designed. I mean, obviously, that took the most dominant form in 2003, where the United States doesn't become a, a sort of outside player, if you like. It becomes a physical presence in the Gulf region itself. It becomes, it becomes the de facto ruler of Iraq. Um, but obviously, you know, that's not the only time. In 1953, what we had was uh, the overthrow of uh, Mossadegh and replaced with uh, the Reza Shah, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> the Shah. Um, in the UK, oper in the UK, that was referred to as Operation Boot, um, and in the US, it was referred to as Operation Ajax. And it was basically the first time that in the region that the US overthrew, overthrew a democratically elected government because it wanted to audit an oil company. Yeah? And so you can sort of see the way that this imperial right operates as the linchpin, the way in which these two systems are understood to interact with one another, and therefore the way in which Saudi Arabia actually operation or helps to operationalize this. So moving on from sort of you know, colonialism to sort of this system of informal rule that exists today, what we also see is that you know, there are tensions between Saudi Arabia and, U and the US hegemony in the region, but ultimately it helped, Saudi Arabia's role is to help uphold this and make sure that, these, the, 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 in return for upholding this imperial rule, this informal system, this access to resources, what needs to happen is that Saudi Arabia must get its security guarantee. So, you know, it, Saudi, the United States will protect Saudi Arabia both internally and externally and has stated that that to be the case since Ronald Reagan. So, as we move into sort of Saudi Arabia's role within the regional subsystem, what we can see is that actually Saudi Arabia feels that not only is it this linchpin, and it serves as this linchpin because it gains a security guarantee, we can also begin to understand why Saudi Arabia has adopted this approach. If we look back to sort of the first Saudi state, it only lasted from 1744 to 1818. Economically, it was successful. It was cemented um, through uh, the Islamic Reformation and the, and the combination of the Saudi and Wahhabi partnership. This um, ended when the Egyptians occupied Deria, uh, leading to its collapse. Now, what's interesting about this is it's not until the sort of 1840s that Al -Saud, the Al Saud dynasty was able to consolidate a sort of smaller geographical space and set up the Second Saudi State, it's, which ended in 1891 with the Al Saud basically dri driven by the Al Rashid dynasty, um, which is one of the many, uh, many Arabian houses, over into exile in Kuwait. By the time you get to the 20th century, what you've got is the Arabian Peninsula as a battleground between the Ottoman Empire and the Arabian Bedouin army that the British and French have encouraged to form. At this point, what you get between 1902 and 1930 is um, Bin Saud basically returned from Kuwait to seize Riyadh, um, relying on the religio-tribal forces to expand, but also aiming to consolidate a non-tribal state with um, a, the sole allegiance to uh, the Al Saud dynasty. So what this means is that, you know, the... the foreign intervention has been absolutely fundamental to the establishment of the state. 
It's not a state that, that exists in and of itself for its own right. It, it, it needs a security guarantee. It has needed a security guarantee because we're already on the third iteration of it. And it, those iterations have proved, the first two proved very vulnerable, both internally and externally. And then the third time, basically to prop itself up, it needs that external security guarantee It need, from a partner in the outside system. So what this means is, if we look through, um, uh, through the way the Al Saud dynasty has operated, is that it was willing to crush the Ikhwan in 1928, um, basically using um, British air power. British air power was basically what provided the means in which the Al Saudi uh, dynasty was propped up within the region. So you can already see that the Saudi state from the very beginning is fragile. It needs an external security guarantee because of the way in which tribal tensions operate on the peninsula. Um, and you can also see the role in which colonial power um, is basically secure, securing the state itself. So for the House of Saud, survival is not abstract. This isn't something that, that, that is, is, is in the back of, uh, uh, of the Saudi royal family's mind because it happened so long ago that no one worries about it. This is, the, the third Saudi state is a new state. It is a state that is less than 90 years old that was founded within living memory. And for that, you know, we, we can forget because of this traditionalism that Saudi Arabia has and, and just how modernized it now appears, just how short a period that, for that movement from traditionalism over to modernization has occurred. Um, and of course, the, this, this itself is something that the Saudis have been very keen to construct, something in which you know, they're very keen to construct their identity of the Middle East in, as a subsystem in a particular way. Because it and sell that as part of the way it constructs and projects itself onto the world. So Saudi Arabia, in that sense, is complicit in the construction of the Middle East as, as an imperial concept. It constructs itself. It narrates the region it, you, it, into a unit of analysis that it itself can rule. It places itself within it. It is a unit that Saudi Arabia's role, if you like, having already been constructed and narrated, is actually to lead. And so, what's the, so what, you know, what this does is it casts the Saudi dynasty as the custodians and heirs of 7th century Islam, you know, elongating that sense of time that it has, as if, you know, like, oh yeah, well obviously I've inherited this from the seventh century, therefore I'm really old and you should all be mystified and bemused by my existence. But it doesn't quite work like that. This is an, it's a new state. Because what it does is the Saudi state tries to argue that its political, political system is rooted in Islamic political thought. And it uses this as the basis of its soft power. It uses this as a sort of way to defend Islam as to, and to sort of say that it, it alone is the defender of true Islam and then uses instruments for education, publication and charity. So that soft power technique is part of the way in which the Saudi Arabia constructs its st the state and its role within the Middle East. So, it, but the Saudis don't just refer to, to the birth of Islam as, as its sole identity. They also adopt that Arab identity to construct the state. It, part of that, it's a recon they, they reconstruct the past. Literally, you know, I've just ran through what the world, world history, what, they, what the Saudis do in their narrative that they project forward to the world in, and, and into the Middle East is they talk about the Middle East being the birthplace of civilization of which Saudi Arabia was a fundamental part, which of course it wasn't. It was a desert. Civilization builds up around rivers, obviously. It's just a fact. So you can, but you can already see how this shift in geography, this mental shift in geography, over to sort of saying, oh, actually, yeah, you know, we're part of the Sumerian state system, part of the, you know, we have this long lineage, obviously allows us this legitimacy to operate in this way, because obviously we're from the region and, and you, you must understand us in a particular way. So what it does is it, that also allows it to be not just the birthplace of Islam and the birthplace of Islamic empires, but it provides it this lineage, this idea that actually Saudi Arabia 
belongs to that sort of golden age, the foundation of modern science. It narrates those spaces. So this isn't an accident. The House of Saud is, is seeking legit, uh, to legitimate its rule and hegemony within the subsystem to prevent a legitimation crisis and survive. It is a state. And in what, mean, what that means is that all the mystification that comes with it, this, you know, this, Saudi Arabia is very exceptional, it's very strange, we don't understand it, um, is it, mainly created. It's created very deliberately in order to, ob to obscure the fact that it is a state. It constructs Saudi exceptionalism um, to legitimate its power and to survive within the subsystem, to help construct and prop up that imperial su su subsystem. And it's been doing, this has been the basis of Saudi policy throughout the 20th and 21st centuries, as it constructs the state itself under the Sa al Saud dynasty. Um, so what this means is that we can see this as the Middle East was really constructed throughout the 20th century. So if we move into the way in which the Middle East was, const was constructed and its different zones, you, it starts with, you know, the ni ni say 1916 with Sykes-Picot um, through to the period of Egyptian hegemony in, uh, in 1954 through to 67. Then what you have after that is this sort of rise of the post- uh, oil, oil producing states and the power from Iran, uh, the growth of power from Iran from 1967 to uh, 73. I'm just going to grab some water quick. <laughs> 